Elevation Church and welcome to our online gathering. A huge welcome if it's your first time with us today. My name is Brad and I get the great privilege of being on team here at Elevation. And we want to say it is an absolute privilege for you to be joining with us today. Over the last season of our, of our services, we've been talking around the topic of conversation around loving well. Our lead pastor, Pastor Ross Abraham, is going to continue that today. And I, I don't know about you, but the messages have, have encouraged me greatly. And so uh, I, I think you're going to need to buckle up because this week is an absolute great message around a slowed down spirituality. So looking forward to that. But before we do that, we're going to have some worship. And right now, we're going to give us an opportunity to bring our ties into the storehouse. And so right now, the details are coming up on screen. We want to say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for allowing us to advance kingdom of God in this time in our cities. And uh, as I said, all the details right now are either below me on screen or they're coming up right now in the chat. And so I pray a blessing over your finances. Thank you for your generosity. And uh, we, we, we love partnering with you and advancing the kingdom of God in our cities. Well, worship is here, well, wherever you may be, at home, in a cafe, why don't you stand as we gather together to worship God.
Well, welcome Elevation Church. So great to be with you today. And uh, we're in part five of our season talking about building and creating a loving well culture. And thus far from week one, it's been looked beneath the surface. And uh, that's the iceberg being prepared and the courage to, to understand why we do some of the things we do. Week two, going back in order to move forward, understanding that our family of origin does impact us somehow. But more importantly, the, the new family of Jesus shapes us uh, uh, in a greater dimension. It's, it's discovering that. Week three, minimizing the mask, learning to live with some vulnerability and transparency. Last week, week four, seeing limitations as God's grace in disguise. And I really loved that one on uh, just understanding that uh, God loves us so much that He has placed limitations around us to protect us. And today, I want to share on a really, really important subject called a slowed down spirituality. And then next week, we'll wrap up this, this season. Um, I don't know whether you've ever imagined someone or reading in the news, someone being trapped in a supermarket and dying of starvation. Uh, you don't hear of it, but ironically in our spiritual world, that's basically what's happening to so many of us, that, that we are in a supermarket of God's abundant love and His mercy and His grace and the promises of God. And yet so many of us find ourselves, myself included, spiritually starving. And our, uh, we often find our lives are, are pushed to the brink of burnout. And burnout, interesting, is no longer, like many years ago, burnout was considered this place that you visited, but then you kind of came out of it. Whereas today, burnout is not something you come out of. It's something you basically live in. And we discover that a, a trip to the day spa doesn't resolve it. And, and a one week vacation actually doesn't resolve this, this, this lifestyle that we have created for ourselves. Uh, the pace of life we, we discover is destructive. The lack of margin in our life is debilitating. Um, we're all worn out, we're all tired. Uh, and all of this, this frenetic pace that we find in our life, um, so much gets pushed out of our life. And primarily the number one thing that gets pushed out of our life is our relationship, is our quality time with Jesus. And I just don't mean our devotional time, but it's our time of our life being centered around Jesus that suffers the most. Uh, educator Parker Palmer made a compelling case for burnout uh, where he said this, Burnout merely reveals the nothingness from which I was trying to give in the first place. So let me ask you a question. What would it look like in your life to live at a different pace? Think about that for a moment. If the whole pace of your life slowed down, what if there was a rhythm of life that could instead enable you and I to deeply connect with God a lifestyle that's not dominated by hurry and exhaustion, but dominated with margin and also with joy. So as long as we remain enslaved to a culture of speed, superficiality, distraction, we'll probably never become the people that God has always designed us to be. And I said in week one, as we kicked off this whole thought, this statement that changing the way we have lived for 20 or 40 or 60 years is nothing short of a revolution. And if we need anything right now for ourselves, it is a revolution which leads us to a revival, that our souls would come alive again with the presence of Jesus. So let me give you one overarching thought that we want to build off today, and it's this. How do we start? Where do we start in this whole slowing down spirituality? Here, here it is. By paying attention to our inner space and our outer pace. So it's twofold, our inner space and our outer pace. 
And the inward look is, is not to encourage a self-absorbed introspection that feeds narcissism. Okay, I want to make that really clear. The ultimate purpose of looking on the inside is to allow the gospel to transform us both above the iceberg and below the iceberg. So the end result for you and I will be that we'll be better lovers of Jesus, better lovers of other people, and ultimately better lovers of ourselves. So in all, we'll be loving well in all that we do. Dallas Willard, uh, and he's now passed away, but he was an author, a philosopher, and really a, a father of spiritual formation. He was once, to, uh, once asked, what do I need to start doing to become the person God wants me to be? His answer was simply this, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. So eliminating and I love the word ruthless that he's thrown in there because it's not easy. Hurry is probably the number one way that we can forge a fresh, reinvigorated, revitalized, revolutionary, revival relationship with Christ. So if we want to experience the life of Jesus, we have to adopt the lifestyle that Jesus has taken on. I said again a few weeks ago that there was a well-known Hebrew blessing in the first century that basically went like this. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi, which basically is talking about that you would be so close to your rabbi, a disciple would be so close that as they walk, the dust from their feet would kick up from their sandals over your your uh, humanity. And that's the whole thought here that a rabbi walked slowly. Their disciples with them walked slowly. Walter Adams was the spiritual director to C.S. Lewis. He once said this, to walk with Jesus is to walk a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. You know, and truth be told, hurry is often a sign of something else. It's often a sign of something deeper, that, that we're running away from something. We're, we're running away from, you know, previous traumas or relational breakdowns or insecurities or deficits in our worth, and fears and failures. And oftentimes it means that we're running to something. You know, we're, we're not just running away, but we're running to. We're running to the promotion. We're running to the next Instagram post. We're running to the next online purchase or the, the next uh, 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 sense of self-worth that we're looking for. In all of it, either way, it's unhealthy for us. I've just been reading a book by a Japanese, believe it or not, theologian. His name was Kazuki Kuyama. And uh, the book is called Three Mile an Hour God. And I love it. Here's basically the book in a summary. He said this, It is wise for us to travel at God's speed. God has all the time in the world. And as a result, he is not in a rush. Thus, God walks at three miles an hour. On average, humans walk at this pace also. And it's, it is such an ambling, unhurried and leisurely moments that we often encounter God. In Mark chapter 1, verse 16, uh, one simple verse, it simply says this, Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. It's when he found his disciples and he says to them, come, follow me. So Jesus walked. It was a leisurely walk along the Sea of Galilee where he identified the next generation of leaders, the the people that would carry on his cause after he is taken to the cross. N.T. Wright, Anglican bishop, said this, It is only when we slow down our lives that we can catch up to God. So God walks slowly. Because he is love, God walks slowly. Let me read to you from 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to verse 8. It says this, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So if God wasn't love, he would probably move a lot faster. But what I've discovered, and no doubt you've discovered, that love has its own speed. 
You, you can't speed up a love relationship. You can't go from meeting a potential partner to, to the wedding day too quickly because love has its own speed. It's an internal speed. It's a spiritual speed. And it's a different kind of speed to the technological speed that we have today and that we're so accustomed to. It is a slowed down speed. And God is love. And if the author of Three Mile an Hour God is right, God has all the time in the world. And so he's never in a hurry. And I know that's a frustration for us, but there's something in this that I think that we have missed. And society today isn't allowing us to capture this thought about our relationship with God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says this, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. This is for you and I. This is the kind of fruit that every follower of Jesus should be presenting. Love, joy, peace, patience. There's that word, that P word. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, these are, these are more than just emotions. They are overall conditions of our heart. And if we're to produce this kind of fruit, fruit doesn't grow quickly. Oftentimes fruit is a labor intensive, slow process. Uh, they're not just pleasant feelings that the Apostle Paul talks about. These are the kinds of, of things, the characteristics that a follower of Jesus should actually have in their life. And if you notice all of them, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, they are all incompatible with hurry. Total opposites. Think of joy. I mean, I mean the, the, you cannot read one article, whether it be Christian or not, where people don't agree on this one fact that the greatest key to joy, the greatest key, if you use a secular word, to happiness is simply being present in the moment, being a person that embraces and engages where we are at right now. They say that is the key characteristic for every single one of us to discover real joy or happiness, as some coin it, in life. And the temptation is, is not to be present, it's to be present in what I want and what, what I'm looking to. And again, I, I beat the drum of social media that teaches us that unless you are like, then you can't really have fulfillment in life. But that's not what scripture has for us. And the more present we are now, the more grateful we are for what is, the more that we can tap into the real joy of living. And is it any wonder when Paul said that these are the, these are the fruits that the Holy Spirit wants to develop in our life and, and they just don't run in the same pace, in the same lane as hurry. So I have a question for all of us today and it's this. In what ways does my current pace of life and leadership enhance or diminish my ability to allow God's will and presence full scope in my life. Let me read it one more time because this is about slowing down. In what ways does my current pace of life and leadership, think of your leadership in your job, in home, in whatever uh, uh, scope you can think of, in what way does my, life, my current pace of life and leadership enhance or diminish my ability to allow God's will and presence full scope in my life? You know, in, in our culture, the word slow is always painted as a negative. I think back to when I was a kid and one of the first report cards I got, and I've still got it somewhere at home, where, where it was the old school ones where the teacher would write a note about you to your parents. And it said this, actually my first four or five for the first few years of my life said this, Ross is a wonderful student, but he's a little bit slow. And, uh, you know, I think I know what they were meaning, but I was, I was just kind of a little bit slow to churn out work. I don't think it was the other slow, although it could have been. But if we have someone, if we meet someone uh, uh, or people are describing someone with a low IQ, what do we call them? We call them slow. Uh, if service at a restaurant is lousy, we call it slow. Well, uh, if, if a movie is boring, uh, we call it 
slow. And so if you look up the word in any dictionary, it's always painted in a way that is not really the word we want to apply to ourselves. It's uh, as different dictionaries say, not quick or fast, taking a long time to perform a function, mentally dull, stupid, naturally inert or sluggish, lacking a readiness, promptness or willingness. So when, when, you, when you understand this, the message is really clear in 21st century that slow is bad, fast is good. This is what Paul said about this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. He said this, look carefully then how you walk. Now, as you know, I've done a lot of hikes, done Kokoda several times and, and biked around Australia a few times. And, and uh, you know, this looking carefully then how you walk or how you ride is really important because when you're going fast, it's really hard to pick up debris on the road. When you're going fast over Kokoda, the hills of Kokoda with 20 kg on your back, you, you're going to burn out pretty quickly. So when Paul says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. So a wise person is what he's saying, thinks carefully, looks carefully how he is walking, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. So if we want to be a wise person, if we want to be someone that walks according to what the Apostle Paul is saying here, a couple of things. We've got, we've got to look carefully how we're doing life, how we're spending our time. We've got to really look at it and say, is this the wisest way for me to be spending my time? Is what I'm signing up to, is what I'm about to purchase, is it what I'm about to agree to, is what I'm about to, to, to sign off on the wisest way for me to conduct my life? Is it the wisest way for me to make the use of my time? Because the days are evil. All around us, there is a fight for your time. You know, in the mid 1800s, people went to bed and rose from their, their slumber according to the sun. So sundown meant it was time to get ready for bed. Sun up, it was time to, to get ready for your day. I mean, to me, perfect world. But then, uh, uh, you know, in the later 1800s, the light bulb was invented and suddenly people's lives changed forever. It meant that you could come home from a big day and you could squeeze a few more hours into your day because of the light bulb. So in the mid 1800s, we went from sleeping approximately 11 hours a night to now where they say the average is seven hours a night. So you can see already four hours over those years has been lost because of the pace of life. And I'm sure that we all make the most of those extra four hours. I'm not paying out on them. But then come to 2007 when Steve Jobs launched the first iPhone and what has changed in the world in those brief 13 years? Uh, the technological advance that has happened from, uh, you know, and I'm not even gonna start naming them all, but it's just absolutely amazing how this one launch changed our worlds forever. On Netflix, talking about uh, uh, how our world has changed, there's a documentary called The Social Dilemma. And if you get a chance, if you're a parent, I really encourage you to uh, uh, watch it because it really is informative on the whole world of social media and, and um, the digital age. But they said this, your phone doesn't actually work for you. You pay for it, yes, but it works for a multi-billion dollar corporation in California, not for you. You're the customer, oh, sorry, you're not the customer, you're the product. It's your attention that's for sale along with your peace of mind. Wow, when this is from people who actually were behind the invention right there. You know, every year in Australia, most Australians spend about 854 hours a year on social media, another 1,825 hours per year just watching something mind-numbing on TV. And you think back to maybe when you were a kid, certainly when I was a kid, you had to get up to change one of your four channels or three channels on your TV, where now it's Alexa's job, it's, it's a series job to do all that for us. And I'm not advocating that we go back to the dial-up stage uh, or we start catching boats instead of planes, but we've got to look for all of us and ask ourselves the question, has our pace of life actually enhanced or diminished when it comes to our relationship with people and our relationship with Jesus. 
And what I've discovered and, and, uh, uh, and is reinforced by the truth that unless we live with an intentional commitment, intentional commitment to slow down a little bit, then we have no hope for a quality of life that allows Jesus to transform us into his image. And when you look at the life of Christ, as I get ready to close, when you look at the, the, the life of Christ, quite often, a, a lot of times actually, he would withdraw into the wilderness before or after being with people. And, uh, you know, in the coming seasons in Elevation, we'll do a whole teaching around this because it's quite uh, um, confronting uh, when Jesus actually, you know, right at the moment of a crisis, found himself withdrawing. And there was this rhythm that Jesus had of, of um, retreat to the wilderness and then return to the ministry. Uh, a retreat to be renewed and then a return to, to go to the cross. A retreat when he got the sad news about John the Baptist being uh, uh, losing his life and then a return to continue to ministering to the masses. And I'll give you a few verses here. Luke chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. It says this, but now even more, the report about him, that's Jesus, went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. I mean, he is on a roll. He's what you and I would say, man, things are really happening. I can't take a holiday right now. I can't have time out. I can't have this extra hour just to kind of reflect. I can't take 15 minutes to sit in the lunchroom and just kind of get my breathing under control because people need me. In verse 16, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So the masses are lined up, man. The, 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 the queues have lined up. They've, they've all done their COVID registration. They are ready for him. And Jesus, where is he? He's withdrawn to the wilderness to pray. Matthew 14, verse 13. And as soon as he had heard the news, this is about John the Baptist, his cousin um, being beheaded. He left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. I mean, that gives you a little picture on how Jesus dealt with grief. You know, when, when, when sad news came, he didn't just say, you know what, just shove it down and just keep on fake it till I make it. I mean, he, he went alone just to kind of work this out with his father. He had to wrestle with some, some belief systems here. Man, I, I, I don't get this. What's going on here? Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Mark chapter 1, verse 12. At once the Spirit sent Jesus out into the desert, and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. Let me just give you a little bit of insight as we wrap up. The word wilderness here in the Greek language is the word eremos, eremos. And what it means is this. It means a desert place. It means a deserted place. It means a solitary place, a desolate place, a lonely place, a quiet place. And this Eremos is the place where Jesus often found himself retreating to and then returning from. And although hanging out in the desert doesn't sound too romantic, it doesn't sound very attractive to us, there's something more in this. And there are four characteristics that I'll take you through right now that actually happen in our Eremos, in our wilderness, that I believe as a, as a church, Elevation, and again, part of our discipleship of, of loving well for 2021 and beyond is encompassing this. So we're going to be unpacking this a lot more. This is just big picture today, but there's four things that the Eremos can help us in our disciplines of having this well-centered, slowed down spiritual, uh, uh, spirituality and, and relationship with Jesus. Uh, firstly, there's solitude. In our Eremos, there's, there's time alone. It's a place that we find just to be alone, just you and Jesus. Secondly, there's silence in our Eremos. There, there's a, a time where, where the noise is minimized. The phone is put to bed. The, the TV is off. The social media is disconnected for a while. And it's, and it's you. It's me. It's Jesus. It's his word. It's his voice. Uh, thirdly, there's the Sabbath. 
It was a big part of New Testament and Old Testament teaching of, of how do we do a day a week where we just enjoy relationship, we enjoy Jesus, we enjoy life, we, we recapture our breath. And I know right now for a lot of us go, well, that, that cannot happen in my world. But trust me in this, that as we dig into it next year, you'll discover there are ways that we can actually make this happen in our over busy, complicated worlds. And number four is, is the Eremos teaches us simplicity, is that when you're in the wilderness, it kind of strips away everything that doesn't really matter and leaves us with the bones of what really does matter. And um, part of our, 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 our journey in discipleship next year is what I'm wanting to do is, is do several weekends throughout the year at Besor Ranch, our beautiful property that's owned by our network of churches in the Tweed Valley, where, where for a night and a day that, that we can get people away just to practice this. Just well, We're going to unplug and we're going to learn the art of slowing down and hopefully allow that to transfer into our everyday life, some of the principles, some of the practices, and we can slow down our pace and actually be with Jesus. This place, this Eremos, Jesus spent a large chunk of his time. There was no place for distractions. It was a, almost like a physical hiding place where, but there's no hiding from who you are. It wasn't like, well, I man, I'm going to get away and, and pretend it, it's, it's you and God. It's, it's where everything is seen. And, you know, as humans, we love to distract ourselves. We love to numb the effects of reality. And predictably, we just become less human less able to feel, less able to focus, less able to deeply enjoy the life that God has given us. But this Eremos, I believe, is going to be a place of transformation for you and I. For Jesus, it was a place to retreat to, to be refreshed, so he could then re-engage with the calling and purpose upon his life. So I'm going to close and I'm going to pray. And in this, I just want this to be a prayer where there's space for God to speak to us today. So why don't you join with me and let's pray. Father, today, firstly, Lord, we recognize that we live in a hurried, hurried world and each and every one of us is caught in the cycle of hurry. And right now there are people listening to me excusing themselves because somehow we feel like we're the unique one that unless I live this life of hurry, nothing will ever happen. But Father, for each and every one of us, where hurry has pushed us out of deep relationship with others, maybe even in our marriages, deep relationship ultimately with you, where our reading of scripture is minimal, it's rushed, where our prayer is rushed and often said over a coffee as we're pulling up at a red light. Or, and not that anything is wrong with that, but I believe that COVID has taught us that you're wanting something deeper from your people. So today we bring our hurried, frantic hearts and we surrender them to you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would breathe upon us Encourage us that none of us are beyond finding our desert place, the place where we can retreat to only so we can re-engage with new vigor for our hearts. So Holy Spirit, I thank you today. Breathe upon us, I pray. Hey, what a great message from Ross around a slowed down spirituality. You know, uh, we're gonna take a moment right now just to uh, reflect on our own life. And as Ross said, maybe, maybe this hurried state has, has never allowed us to ask that question of a relationship with Jesus. Maybe this hurried state has pulled us away from a relationship that we've had with Jesus. And so right now, before the service comes to a conclusion, I'll, I want to give this invitation to you, an invitation to accept Christ, to invite Him into your life.
And that's simply all, all that means is that you're giving you're giving someone you're, you're you're saying God, I can't do this on my own. This life, I cannot do it on my own. So Jesus, I need you in my life to help me get through this. And so it's as simple as clicking the button right now that is in our chat form right there, and that will take you through to one of our team members who are waiting to talk with you, who are waiting to to do this journey with you. And so if that's you in this place, and you're simply saying God, I need you to help me live this life. I need you to live on the inside of my life to help me through and please click that button right now and our team are waiting to talk to you to give you some resource and let you know how we can help you it'll be the greatest decision that you've ever made well that's it from us trust that you click that button trust that you have a great day and uh, we will see you again next week for our online gathering